So good evening, everyone. I want to thank Elon University and the organizers for, for inviting me to be here. It's really a huge pleasure, and I've had a great day. Um, and, and I'm so excited to talk to, you, to all of you and, and share some of my experiences. And, and I really want to thank all of you, because just by being here tonight, you're all really on the leading edge of the movement for a better food system. I have been in awe of all the students that I've met um, over the last uh, 12 or 15 hours since I arrived. Um, your generation is really thinking critically about food issues in a way that mine, unfortunately, didn't. And, and because you're thinking more globally, farmers and policymakers and businesses are changing their practices. And, and I'm so excited to see where each of you really takes uh, our food system over the next generation. Um, and, and you all really inspire me. It's been so great to meet so many of you and you know, eat a couple of meals with you and, and talk to your, your different classes. So thank you. I, I also know that many of you share my conviction that there are socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable ways that we can put in place today to build a food system that makes hunger, food waste, poverty, and obesity part of the world's past, not its future. Uh, last year, I had the pleasure of listening to Chef Dan Barber, who's the, the, the lead chef at Blue Hill Restaurant at Stone Barns in, in New York. And uh, Food Tank was working with uh, Stone Barns and Chef Barber to put on the New York Times uh, conference Food for Tomorrow last November. And so I was listening to, to Chef Barber, and he said that the recipe for sustainable agriculture is constantly changing and evolving. And he's absolutely right. Farmers, eaters, businesses, policymakers, scientists are really always continuing to learn the best ways to increase nutrition and nutrient density, protect natural resources, and raise incomes for, for farmers across the globe. But there are some basic ingredients for this recipe um, uh, for sustainable agriculture, and that's really what I want to focus on tonight. And, and this is not a recipe I came up with on my own, and, and Chef Barber didn't come up with it either. Uh, but it, it really evolved by interviewing hundreds and hundreds of farmers, researchers, government leaders, NGOs or in nonprofit organizations, journalists, and, and other stakeholders in the food system in 50 plus countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And it really gave me a unique opportunity to hear firsthand what they think it's going to take to overcome these, these environmental and social problems that are a result of the food system while also protecting the environment in their own countries. And, and ironically, their recommendations, the recommendations of these folks in other parts of the world, are not that different from farmers I've met in the US and Canada and, and Europe. Meeting all of these, these stakeholders was a really incredible experience, not only because I learned that despite all of our differences, there's a shared belief that the current response to hunger it is, isn't working, and that we need to follow the lead of, of people in other countries rather than always insisting that they follow ours. And, and one farmer I spoke with in Kenya put it to me best, and he said that he has been innovating all along, just as his grandfather and his father used to do. And this innovative capacity is really evident all over Sub-Saharan Africa and, and all over the developing world. Uh, for example, in Ethiopia, I met with farmers who started a low-cost rainwater harvesting and erosion control project to battle drought and poverty, which resulted in increasing their yields and, and, and also their incomes. In India, I met with women entrepreneurs who are providing low-cost, high-quality food to the urban poor. In the Gambia, I met with fisher folk who are finding ways to protect marine resources and preserve fish harvests. In Brazil, I encountered farmers from all over the world who had gathered in Rio to really encourage global policymakers to recognize the contribu contributions of farmers to protecting ecosystem services, something that they are rarely recognized for. And there were countless other farmers and other stakeholders who showed me the components of what a sustainable global food system could look like. And, and after spending so much time on the ground, I'm really convinced that the way things are right now isn't the way they have to be. 
I'm convinced that we can help build a food system that combats poverty and alleviates hunger, not by treating the natural environment as an obstacle to sustainable growth, but by realizing it's a precondition for it. A food system where science is our servant, not our master, and where it's understood that costly, complicated technologies aren't always the most appropriate technologies. And a food system that honors our values, where women, workers, and consumers all have a seat at the table and no one is left on the outside looking in. And we have a real opportunity to build that kind of system. Uh, it, the problem is we don't have a minute to waste. It needs to happen quickly. And, and today, or tonight, what I, I want to do is just discuss a few components of, of what of the strategy or, again, a recipe to create you know, this sustainable food system, a truly sustainable food system. And, and as I said before, there are a lot of different ingredients, but these are a few of, the, of the, the components that I think deserve more attention. First, preserving what may be agriculture's most important but overlooked input, input and that's soil. Second, finding ways to prevent food loss and food waste. And third, growing more food in cities. Last but not least, I also want to recognize the important role of women farmers in the food system. So let me start by talking about the ground beneath our feet. Uh, the United Nations General Assembly declared 2015 the International Year of Soils to help increase awareness and understanding of its many important roles in the food system. Soil is more than just dirt. It's really the foundation of a healthy food system, storing and filtering water, providing resilience to drought, and sequestering carbon. And the loss of topsoil could be one of the biggest threats to, to our food supply and, and global food security. Uh, unfortunately, this vital ingredient is uh, being degraded and eroded at unprecedented rates uh, across the world. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, 25% of the planet's land is highly degraded, and only 10% is improving. Half of the topsoil on the planet has been lost just in the last 150 years. And just over the past 40 years, 30% of the world's arable land has become unproductive. Overgrazing of grassland in the western United States is reducing soil depth and creating desertification. In India, overcutting trees is reducing soil fertility and threatening wild medicinal plants. And industrial agriculture practices around the world expose topsoil and increase erosion. In Brazil alone, the country loses 55 million tons of topsoil every year as a result of soybean production. Uh, Wes Jackson, who's one of my many heroes in the food movement, he's an agronomist and the founder of the Land Institute, says we're plowing through our soil bank account and sending those riches downstream to the ocean. But there are solutions. Growing a diversity of crops rather than relying on just one crop like corn or soybeans can help restore soil nutrients and help farmers, both large and small, get more nutrients per acre. In Western Africa, farmers are raising cattle and using their manure to fertilize crops and promote earthworm production. This not only helps restore nutrients to soils and helps protect soil microbiota, those little critters that I know you all know live in the soil and really make it nutrient rich, but it also helps farmers save money by reducing the need for them to continually buy artificial fertilizer. Jerry Glover is an agronomist uh, with USAID, and he calls for more research into perennial crops. Unlike an annual crops, these crops uh, survive from season to season and have deep root structures that can stabilize soils and hold water. Perennials like sorghum, peas, and beans are also very nutritious, providing an extra source of, of both human and livestock feed to, to families uh, all over the developing world. According to Glover, more than half of the world's population depends on marginal landscapes unsuited for producing annual crops. But perennial crops can be sustainably produced on those lands and really help improve farmers' yields and, again, their incomes. Farmers all over the world are also revitalizing soils by incorporating cover crops, such as winter wheat, rye, and clover. 
Again, these are, are crops that can be used for, for animals and in some cases, you know, for human food. Um, and they prevent erosion by uh, keeping the soil in the ground. Uh, here in the US, there's a, a great slogan going around among farmers who use cover crops, and it's, don't farm naked, because you want to keep the, the land covered. Um, and, and again, the, these cover crops can help uh, farmers save money by providing a natural source of fertilizer rather than um, forcing farmers to always buy artificial fertilizer. The, the second part of the recipe that I want to talk about is finding ways to minimize food loss and food waste. And you don't have to be religious to recognize that it's a sin that roughly 40% of the global harvest is wasted before it ever reaches people's stomachs. In the United States, roughly one third of the food we produce is thrown, thrown away as a result of overbuying or misinterpretation of expiration and sell by dates. In, in parts of the developing world, an equal amount of food is lost because of poor infrastructure, pests, and disease. So as a result, all of the hard work that farmers go into uh, producing this food, the labor, the inputs, everything else goes to waste and, and can plunge farmers in the developing world deeper into poverty. Food waste tends to be insidious. A little bit is lost in the field, a little bit is lost in transport, a little bit is lost in storage, and then finally a little bit is, is lost in, in stores and in our homes. And, and while preventing food waste presents, obvious, you know, moral, uh, presents an obvious moral challenge to us all, it, it also presents a lot of environmental problems. Food releases methane gas as it decomposes in landfills. Methane is a, a greenhouse gas that's about 27 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And according to the US Environmental Protection Agency, landfills are the third largest source of human-related methane emissions in the United States. The good news, because there's always good news, is that preventing food waste can be both simple and, and inexpensive. And some of the most interesting innovations that I've seen are taking place in, in the developing world. Um, in India, I visited with farmers who are drying mangoes. Um, to make sure that their families have access to vitamin A throughout the year. The mango seasons can be very short, and you, you can't eat all those mangoes at once um, before they, they go to waste. And so this helps them get access to that vital nutrient and also gives them extra income from the sale of dried fruit throughout the year. In, in Eastern Africa, the organization One Acre Fund is helping farmers learn not only how to store their crops better, but also helping them learn to keep better track of, of how food is wasted. Um, they're, they're using these very simple tracking sheets to see how much they grow and then how much is lost from one season to the next. And as a result of, of being able to document how food is wasted, they've developed uh, better storage bags and better storage containers to protect their, pests, uh, protect their crops from pests. Of course, on the consumer side, the solutions to limiting food waste are very simple. Uh, don't buy more than what you can eat. Store your produce properly. Take leftovers home. Don't throw away food that hasn't gone bad. And trust your senses, not the dates on packages and products, uh, to tell you if food has gone bad or not. In, in the United Kingdom, there are a couple of different um, uh, activist groups uh, one is uh, Love Food, Hate Waste, which I, it always makes me laugh every time I see it, say it. And they're really um, helping educate consumers by offering tips for storage, uh, recipes of how to use leftovers, and, and how to use food that's you know, getting close to its expiration date. They've also developed this really cool um, portion size calculator that helps people determine how much you know, spaghetti to cook per person, or how many potatoes to buy, or how much meat to cook. And I think this is especially important for new or, or young cooks who don't always have a sense of, of how much to cook and whose eyes are, are typically bigger than their stomachs. And, and restaurants, I'm going to go back to Dan Barber for a second. A few weeks ago, he had a pop-up restaurant called Waste Ed, the ED in, in capitals. And, 
they really went the extra step to show eaters that kale ribs, uh, bruised vegetables and fruits, and fish heads are not actually garbage, but can be turned into delicious meals. This, this action on the consumer side does not, however, absolve manufacturers and food retailers of their responsibilities. And uh, a couple of interesting developments, Intermarché, which is a grocery store chain in France, is now marketing ugly vegetables, vegetables that you know, wouldn't be seen otherwise, you know, misshapen carrots, uh, uh, apples with you know, nubs on them, those kinds of things, and, and selling them to consumers and educating them that you know, these products, while they might not look perfect, actually taste really good. Um, and, and other countries and other retailers are really following suit, including one of the biggest food retailers in Canada. I should also add that, that organizations like City Harvest in New York uh, has pioneered collecting food that would have otherwise been wasted to redistribute to homeless shelters and low-income families. And they've been doing this for almost as long as I've been alive, so more than 30 years, and really getting that food to people who need it the most. Uh, in a similar vein, the Food Recovery Network is mobilizing hundreds of college students across the country to collect perishable food from their campuses and communities and, and to distribute it to those in need. And I, I didn't know really until today that Elon has also been a leader uh, with Campus Kitchens and helping you know, get food that would have otherwise been wasted to, to homeless shelters and to senior citizen centers and others. And it's just such an important way to make sure that food isn't lost. The next component I want to talk about briefly is farming the cities. Um, urbanization rates are expected to increase 70% by 2050. And you know that more and more of us are, are moving to cities, we're living in cities. And if we're going to feed all of the, these, uh, these growing populations, We'll need to make cities and towns and para-urban areas outside of cities into centers of food production, not just consumption. Worldwide, there are nearly a billion urban farmers, and many are having the greatest impact in communities where hunger and poverty are, are most acute. Um, it, I, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Kibera, which is a slum um, in, in Kenya. And it's believed to be one of the largest slums in the world, uh, with anywhere from 700,000 to 1 million people living there. And in, in parts of Kibera, urban farmers have developed uh, what they call vertical gardens. And they grow vegetables like kale or spinach and in tall, empty rice or maize sacks that they fill with dirt. And then they're able to grow punch holes in the bag and then grow food on different levels. And at harvest time, you know, they, they consume part of what they grow, and they also earn you know, a, a minimal income from selling that produce to, to other consumers in, in the slum. But you know, while these might sound like a very simplistic sort of container garden to most of us, the value of them should not be underestimated. Uh, during the riots that occurred in, in Nairobi and other parts of Kenya, in 2007 and 2008, no food could really come into the city. Uh, but the urban farmers who were living, uh, who, who used these sacks and who lived in Kibera are, are really credited with helping feed you know, thousands of, of men, women, and children during that very chaotic time. And, and I think that the role of, of folks like farmers in Kibera in saving lives is likely only a precursor of, of things to come. In much of the less developed world, food purchases can take up as much as 80% of a family's income. And in countries where war and instability can send the, the, the price of food skyrocketing overnight, urban agriculture will be fundamental to helping prevent food riots and wide-scale hunger. So in that respect, I think promoting more agriculture in cities isn't only morally right or environmentally smart, but I'd also argue very ne uh, necessary for regional and national security and stability. The next ingredient I want to talk about in this recipe for a more sustainable food system is cultivating more equality. So as a woman, I, it's absurd to me that we make up more than half of the world's population and women make up nearly half of the world's agricultural labor force, but women's contributions as farmers go almost 
unnoticed and are almost universally ignored. And for a lot of people, I get it, when they think about agriculture, they think of men out in fields or sitting in the cabs of, of combines or tractors. But that's not the kind of agriculture I'm talking about. I'm talking about women who tend dairy cows in Ghana, who weed vegetable uh, gardens for school canteens in the Ivory Coast, who pick tomatoes in Florida, who grow flowers in Kenya, who raise rabbits in Italy, who harvest tea in India and coffee in Ecuador, or who dry fish in Japan. Again, women make up at least 43% of the global agricultural labor force. But in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, they make up as many as 80% of all farmers. This invisible sisterhood is really, you know, they're a huge part of, of, of world food production. And yet, these working women are often denied access to education, refused by banking and financial institutions, and ignored by extension agents and research organizations. They're still routinely discriminated against just because they are women. But these women are not victims. They're businesswomen. They're stewards of the land. Many have other careers in addition to farming to help put food on the table. They're the caretakers of rich cultural traditions actively preserving indigenous crops and biodiversity. And all of this really occurs in the service of, of food that people actually eat. And, and maybe you think that's an obvious thing to say, but men typically, especially in the developing world, but also here in the United States, tend to produce cash or commodity crops that need to be processed into something else. You can't actually eat them until they're processed. And it's women who grow the fruits and the vegetables and raise the livestock that actually nourish families from day to day. The, the women farmers I've met all over the world tend to work very, very hard. They uh, actually tend to work a lot harder than a lot of the men I've met on the ground. Uh, they certainly work harder than I do. They cook, they clean, they take care of, of children and sick elders, they fetch water and fuel, and yet, again, their work as food producers continues to be ignored. This is why I put so many pictures of women in the slideshow, because I, it's just to reinforce that these are the world's food producers. And, and it doesn't matter how much local organic food we buy or how much money foundations pour into agricultural development unless we listen to what these women farmers want and need and then find ways to work with them to provide it. And this importance of really listening to women hit home for me a few years ago. Um, I was sitting in a circle with about 50 women farmers outside of Ahmedabad, India. And these women knew that I had spent a lot of time talking to farmers all over the world. And so after I finished you know, interrogating them about their, their farming practices and their, their lives, they started asking me questions. And they, they asked what women farmers in, in sub-Saharan Africa were doing to, to combat drought and, and deal with climate change. And so I shared with them what I knew. And, and then since then, what Food Tank and what I've been trying to do is share as many stories as possible and highlight what's working on the ground to really address a, a lot of the challenges I've already listed multiple times, obesity, food waste, hunger, uh, poverty, et cetera. Um, and, and so sharing these stories is part of, of what I do. Uh, in, in Niger, for example, I met with an amazing group of women who had established a, a communal garden using solar drip irrigation to grow vegetables and fruit trees and, and other crops. And before they started the garden, they were making about $300 per year, uh, obviously less than a dollar per day. And, and today they're making about $1,500 per year. So I want you to imagine making five times more uh, next year than you are right now. And you know that's huge, it's transformative. But it's really m more than money that these women have gained. They've been able to innovate their way to a sustainable life. Um, I could talk all night long about uh, women farmers that I've met on the ground, um, and I'll share just a, a couple more stories. And in Ghana, I met with a group of women dairy farmers um, who had started a small dairy cooperative to make yogurt and other products to sell to local schools and uh, businesses. And at first they told me their husbands were really, really angry that they had dared to start this group, this cooperative, behind their backs um, and, and without their permission. 
But as the men saw their family incomes grow and saw how the women were using the money to you know, pay for things like health care and school fees and uh, uh, you know, more nutritious food, their anger you know, gradually turned to respect. These are the women who are changing the food system and really helping make it more sustainability, su sustainable. And, and I want to emphasize that sustainability is not a fad or a catchphrase uh, when we're talking about food. What I mean when I talk about sustainability is a food system that doesn't lurch from crisis to crisis, a system that doesn't use people up and spit them out. Sustainability is what, is what happens when techniques for surviving drought years are shared with the people who need them the most. Sustainability is what happens when women who are making 90 cents a day are now making $5 per day and can provide a better life for themselves and their families. And, and to me, that sounds like a much better definition of sustainability than what we typically hear. And, and the question is, you know, how do we go forward? And there's not a clear path, uh, but I, I do know that the future of food is, is going to be it's going to be so important to listen not only to the needs of women farmers, but all of us in the food system. We need to listen to you as eaters and myself as an eater. You know, there are so many uh, ways that your input is important. And you know, in the big cycle of food, many of us are producers, including I imagine many of you in this room, but all of us are eaters. And as we make headway, I promise you we'll see progress. Because as goes the fate of women, so goes the fate of the world. And that's one thing I've seen over and over again in my travels and in my work. And, and the data actually support this idea. Uh, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, if women farmers had the same access to resources, land, credit, extension services, et cetera, they could increase food production by 20 to 30% and lift as many as 150 million people out of hunger. And that's what brings me to my final point for the evening. The ability, give me one second. It, it's really the, the ability of, of uh, sustainable agriculture to create more robust, resilient food systems. Systems that don't contribute to climate change but can help mitigate and reverse it. And it and a food system that's not only resistant to food price shocks, trade wars, and conflicts, but can really help prevent them. And, and against that sort of backdrop, sustainable agriculture, to me, isn't an option. It's really a necessity. And, and I know I've been showering you with numbers, and I'll, I'll just share a few more. Um, right now, food production accounts for 70% of fresh water use. It's leading to 80% of deforestation around the globe. And it's contributing an estimated 15 to 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's the human endeavor most impacted by higher temperatures, flooding, extreme weather events, and other impacts of climate change. And it's really no exaggeration to say that today's food system is a little bit like the Titanic. It's immense, it's complex, it's really a marvel of engineering, it's thought to be invincible, and it's racing to its destruction. The difference, though, is that unlike the passengers and the crew and the captain of the Titanic, we know the disaster that awaits us if we don't change course. And again, we really need to do it fast. The amazing thing about growing food is that when it is done in a sustainable way, it can help mitigate climate change while at the very same time strengthening food security in developed and industrialized countries alike. I should add that a lot of the practices that I spoke about tonight can be replicated, adapted, scaled up, and used uh, uh, on both small and large farms and, and every sort of farm in between. And to you know, improve water availability, increase crop diversity, improve soil quality, and, and as I have said just a few moments ago, help mitigate climate change. So back to the recipe. How do we promote sustainable agriculture? And, and you know, I think we already know the ingredients. We need governments and research institutions and, and funders and donors to invest in research and technical support that really reaches farmers on the ground. 
We need to introduce more nutrient-dense and nutritious diets so that we don't have this, this paradox of nearly 1 billion people who are hungry and another 2.1 billion people who are overweight or obese. And we need to foster the use of environmentally friendly practices and appropriate technologies and then help farmers gain the skills they need to put them in place. The, not just the practical skills, but also the business skills because that's what farmers are, they're business people. But that's all, you know, those ingredients are really only part of the equation. We also need to stand with women and men who, I, who understand, as I think we all do, that sustainable agriculture can generate wealth, but it takes democratic institutions to guarantee shared prosperity. And, and from Latin America to, to Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa, I've had the, the huge opportunity and honor to meet with literally hundreds of men and women <laughs> who today are really on the leading edge of the greatest transformation of agriculture in our time. They're not scientists. Many of them have never even finished school. They're not only separated by geography, but by faith and traditions that go back long before any of us were around. But together, they share a common vision, a vision of a world where no one's future is determined in corporate boardrooms 5,000 miles away, a vision of communities where everyone understands that you don't need to destroy the environment to feed your family. A vision of a food system that's built to last and an economy that leaves no one behind. And a vision grounded in the conviction that the way things, aren't, the way things are today isn't the way they have to be in the future. That there are stories of hope and success that can be replicated and scaled up throughout the globe. So my ask of you, you know, the day before Earth Day is today, let's send them that, that message that it's, it's our vision too and really find ways to support a, a more sustainable food system. So thank you so much for your time. Again, it was an honor to be here and I'm happy to take any questions. We have this cool microphone in the middle that you can go and stand up or you, know, you can shout from the back or, or whatever works. <laughs>